Do you want to know how to get kids to stop saying bad words? You're not alone. There's a lot of people needing that and we've got a video for you right now. I'm Nicolene Peck and I teach all over the world about parenting, good communication, how to build strong family bonds, child development, education, all through the lens of the principle self-government. And we're talking about bad words. So in this video, we're going to talk about why children say bad words. Why is it that they feel it's necessary to say those bad words? And then what can you do as a parent to make sure that they kick that habit or lose that desire? <laughs> So why do children say bad words? Well, I actually remember when I chose to say bad words when I was young. I also remember knowing it was not good. These are the bad words that mom and dad say not to say. But I felt like I wanted to say them at that time. I just wanted to know what it felt like to say a bad word. I wanted to feel a little bit rebellious. I wanted to feel stronger. I wanted to have more shock value in my statement with my friend. Even though I knew right afterward, I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't the right thing to do. Now, if you've pre-taught your children and, and trained them really well about proper speech and about mastering their mother tongue and having good influence in the world and being able to be respected, by the other people around them, then you've probably taught them that there are certain words, maybe they're swear words, that you do not want them to say. And as the parent, you are not saying the words either. Because one of the reasons that children say the bad words is because their parents say the bad words, or their older sibling says the bad words, or their grandma or grandpa or uncle or aunt says the bad words. So it is very difficult to have a child not experiment with bad words if there are people around them in their daily lives and people that they even look up to may even want to be like who are actually saying the bad words. Example is huge on this. So what's another reason that sometimes children choose to say bad words? Well, it's socially acceptable amongst their peers. Their friends are saying the bad words and so they want to fit in with them and say the bad words too. Sometimes saying a bad word is an accident, so keep that in mind. I remember one time I said a bad word and I was trying to say a substitute for that bad word, but it came out the actual word and it definitely was accidental. Although that did teach me something, this is probably a lesson for another day, but when our children are saying the substitute words, for the bad words, technically they're cursing anyway. Like they, their heart is, I wish I could say that bad word. So actually I did this thing that my parents never even did for me. They taught me say the substitute words. I actually taught my children, don't even say the substitute words. Don't even get anywhere close. How about we just don't curse, period. How about we just say, oh, that happened. That's a no answer or that's unfortunate. You know, how about we think another phrase or analyze it in a different way in our heads so that we do not feel like we need to curse something because that puts us in a bad mood. It makes us feel entitled, angry. It might make us treat people unkindly. So why does it do us any good in the first place? So you could go to that level. I know not everyone will, but that is what I did when I raised my children and when I raised my foster children, my treatment children, who by the way, were all teens and many of them came with some bad words in their vocabulary. So how did I handle it? Let's talk about that. So if you've already subscribed to this channel, then you know that everything on this channel relates to the principle of self-government. That's why it's called teaching self-government. So what is self-government? Self-government is being able to determine the cause and effect of any given situation and possessing a knowledge of your own behavior so that you can control them. So what that means is that you understand cause and effect. You understand yourself. You're analyzing yourself. You're making a plan for where you want to head in this conversation, in this relationship, with this goal. You are making a deliberate plan and then you follow through with that plan and if you go off course, you bring yourself back on course. 
And if you figure out the plan was not a good one, you get a new plan, right? That's what a person does who's fully self-governing. And children can do this. Even tiny children can learn to self-govern. They can be given a plan and learn what the results of that plan will be. And then they will follow through without even fully cognitively understanding why they're following through with that plan. They just know that it works to follow through with that plan. So let's talk about the bad words. When my foster children came to our home, we taught them something called a family standard. Now you can find out about a family standard and what a family standard is on my website. If you go to teachingselfgovernment.com, there's a, a book there called Parenting a House United. My family standard is in that book. That's not just what the book about. That's just one little chapter about family standards. But also in my TSG parenting course, we talk about family standards and how to implement those in your home. In our family, we created a family standard that had to do with things like what we would take into our bodies and what we wouldn't, how we would treat each other, what language we would use, what things we would watch on TV, how we would handle digital things, the way we would handle friends and friend time, and I mean, just clothing choices, modesty choices, all of that kind of stuff was actually part of our family standard. This was a big, important part of our family. As I was bringing foster children into my home all the time, I had to have something set and in place so that all of these things that would come in with the foster children would not impact everybody else who was already there. We couldn't disrupt stuff all the time. We had to keep our standards strong. Parents who do not set up a family standard with their children are actually doing their whole family a disservice because if you don't establish what your standard is, then you have to be reactive and emotional about everybody's choices all the time. If you plan it ahead of time, then if they want to pick something that does not fit your family standard, it's super easy. You can just say, oh, that's a no answer because that's not in our family standard. So in our family standard, we said that there were certain types of language like swearing and cursing and a language that was rude and unkind to others that was going to be a no answer. So then I had to teach them some of the skills of self-government. One of the four basic skills of self-government teaches the skill accepting a no answer or accepting criticism, which basically can feel like the same thing. So these books here are the Teaching Self-Government Children's Book set and each of them teach one of the four basic skills of self-government. When a person learns the four basic skills of self-government, that actually takes care of 99% of their behavioral problems. So this book here, Porter Earns a Quarter, that I wrote about my son, Porter, teaches the skill accepting no answers and criticism. There are four steps to that skill. The four steps to accepting a no answer or criticism are, look at the person or the situation. So here I am in a situation with swearing. There are other people around me swearing, let's say. My friends are swearing. Or maybe if you're an adult and you wanna kick the habit too, your colleagues are swearing, okay? Or your good friend is swearing. They're swearing, it's exciting language, it feels rebellious and wild and free and fun and whatever it feels like to you or to your child. That's the situation. So I looked at the situation. This is what's going on. My friends are swearing. It feels exciting. I want to be part of the excitement and swear too, but I know that I shouldn't. That is the situation. In order to fully look at that situation, I had to describe to myself what I'm seeing within me and the people around me. That means that usually you have to pause, think what's going on here? What am I craving to do right now? Is that what I really want to do? You have to have an inner dialogue. That's how you properly look at the situation. Step number two is you keep a calm face, voice, and body. So then if I were looking at the situation after I examined what was happening and how I was feeling this craving to swear too, then I would say, be calm. Be calm in your brain, Nicolene. Be calm in your body, be calm in your voice. Swearing is not a calm voice. So use words that are a calm voice. What words have you prepared to use, right? So I would keep a calm face, voice, and body, which also means I'm not gonna laugh at my friends swearing. If I don't wanna tell myself or them that it was a good idea to swear, I'm not gonna laugh at it, joke with it. I'm also not gonna be like, oh, I'm so shocked or whatever. I'm just gonna carry on 
Okay. If I'm teaching my child, I may even teach my child to tell their friend, oh, hey, I don't swear. Is it okay if, if you don't swear around me? Because I don't swear. I don't want to hear that. That type of strength to stand up to a friend in a really kind way usually will get respect from the friend and the friend will usually not swear around them. So that's super helpful. Here they are. They've looked at the situation. They've determined to keep a calm face, voice, and body. Then step number three is they either say, okay, this is the situation and I am not going to engage, right? I'm giving myself the no. It's a no for me. Or they disagree appropriately. Now they can either try to disagree appropriately with themselves about why they should swear or they can disagree appropriately with their friend, like I just mentioned, explaining to their friend, hey, how about we don't swear? Or they can say, okay, I'm not swearing. That's it. It's just a no, no matter what happens, I'm not. Or they can do a combination of those things. Then step number four is drop the subject. Whether the friend keeps swearing or stops swearing, don't think about it anymore. You might even have to remove yourself. If it's too tempting to be around a person who says bad words, then you might need to remove yourself from that person because those things can get stuck in your child's head and you might need to teach them how to create a boundary there. But usually you just drop the subject. You just tell yourself, well, that's what they're choosing to do, but that's not what I'm choosing to do. I'm not thinking about those bad words. I'm going to think about something else that I could say that would be much more productive. This is a really intricate self-government process that all adults should and can use, but also young, young children can use this. My young granddaughter, she just barely turned three. Before she was even two, I could give her a no answer about something or her mother could give her a no answer. Like we're going to go into the store and we're not going to touch anything. You need to keep your hands in your pocket and don't touch. And you know what? She would. She would say, okay. And she would look around the store with her hands in her pockets and she would not touch anything. She could do it. She didn't know all the little things, but occasionally she had to have a conversation with herself. And I knew she was having the conversation with herself because I would see her hands come out a little bit and then go right back into her pockets. So you know what that means? She pulled them out and realized, oh wait, am I supposed to do that? No, I'm not supposed to do that. I need to keep my hands in my pockets. The same thing happens with language. We have to have for a while a consistent dialogue going on inside our heads and then we can fix the problem. So what do you do if the person continues to use bad words, even if you've pre-taught them how to handle the circumstance, you've taught them about accepting no answers from themselves to conquer the problem and also from you, well then what you have to do is you have to correct them. So there are skills for correction. I don't have time to go into all those on this video. There are other videos on the channel that do relate to correcting negative behaviors. So you definitely can look that up if you want to, to find another video there. But there are seven steps for a really great correction. One that is calm, and productive. So definitely look that up, get more help. There's a lot of skills to self-government. If you use those, you will be more empowered and confident as a parent. And if you correct the child consistently every single time that they misbehave or they choose to have bad language and then when they've been given a no answer, then they actually will conquer the problem. If you tolerate the bad language, the bad words, if you go, oh, there it is, or hey, stop doing that. If you just do that kind of stuff, it's not going to go away. Nagging and tolerating do not help the person have a change of heart or analyze their behavior and their outcomes. You have to help them with that. Their prefrontal cortexes are very small and they need your assistance. So go ahead and find more videos on the channel about correcting children's negative behaviors and that will help you know what to do next.